Okay, it's week two. What are we doing on week two? Well, I learned my lesson. I think I have to do this lecture after I do the lecture to the, the live students, the ones who are live in a classroom setting, not that you're not live. And the reason I say that is because, boy, uh, they ask a lot of questions while I'm actually lecturing and I don't get as far. So I want to go as far as I got with them to keep these two classes in the same place. And that probably says a lot about to the depth of this stuff. Maybe you guys have a lot of questions and I just don't even know. Anyway, back to Adams. I think I can power through with just one lecture with the amount of material I have. Might go longer than 50 minutes, that'll be fine. Uh, but you won't have two lectures. So first, I had a periodic table up and I had the representative elements. So I will put that back up. It's been a week. I hope you're watching these lectures. As animated as they were yesterday, it makes me realize a lot of the stuff. Um, I have to make sure you stay focused. All right, so it's a little bit smaller than it was last time. Or like this, or like this, and like this, and like this, and like, like this. On the bottom, I had the rare earth elements, and I don't need to have them there now. Now, I know I've said what noble gases are. I just watched what my last lecture was. But I'll say some of these things again. So one, two, three, four, five, H, E, N, E, A, R, K, R. You have this periodic table. That's the one we're using. And today we're going to use this table of polyatomics. I'll walk up to the screen and I'll say there's these polyatomics that I Xeroxed here back in 1991. And I've been Xeroxing this over and over ever since. So let me press autofocus again for that distance. I made it worse. Good. All right, let me continue writing my atoms in. I'll have to do this once. L I B E M G N A A L S I P S C L F, not F L O N C and B. And down here I had a bromine. So I've talked about the name of the one A, the name of the two A. And then I talk about the name of the 7A and 8A. Roman numerals. All right, put my numbers in. Using the atomic number, I don't need the atomic weight right now. We will need that in the future. One, two, that means one proton, one electron, two protons, two electrons, neutrons can change for isotopes. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And then I had a couple more atoms I was using. I was using potassium and I was using calcium. So I might make the mistake and say the same thing twice. I didn't realize I'll go over my entire video from last week, but uh, I won't say it for very long. 19, 20, there's some transition metals there. And bromine with 35 and 36. So, first of all, the column number tells you how many electrons are in the outermost shell. And that's called the valence shell. There's protons in the center, and there's neutrons with protons. The laboratory has that. 
So if we look at the atom of fluorine, it has an atomic number of nine. It's got nine protons. And then the first shell has two electrons. The first shell can have at most two electrons. Helium is a full noble gas with just two electrons, and it's fine. Then the second shell, I'm going to nine total electrons for the neutral atom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are some facts. Two electrons can be in any one region of space. Which we'll call an orbital. Two electrons can be in any one region of space. Electrons are negative. So they should repel each other, and oddly enough, they do repel each other because negative things repel each other and positive things repel each other. Opposites attract, but they want to be in pairs. And we're not really sure why, but we understand they want to be in pairs. So we say one is spinning one way and one is spinning another. And if I show an electron as a half-headed arrow, that would be two electrons paired. Spin up and spin down. A third electron is repelled completely. So a third electron would be repelled. And this is called Pauli's exclusion principle. Only two electrons in any one region of space. A third one's going to be repelled. Now, the column number tells you how many electrons are in the outermost shell. This fluorine has a total of nine electrons. This is the first shell. It's called a period, as I said last time, going across. So the first period is hydrogen and helium, and it only has two electrons. That's the first period. That's the first energy level. This is the second shell, the second period, because periods go horizontal and groups go vertical. So horizontal, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon, that's the second period, the second shell. That would be these electrons here. Sodium has 11 electrons. So if I wanted to go from fluorine to sodium, total of 11, I would change something and say, well, for sodium, that would be 11 protons and 11 electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. That takes me as far as neon. And then I would create a third shell, and this would be sodium's electronic configuration. It has one electron in its outer shell. And it's a 1A element. It has one electron in its outer shell. When we a moment ago did fluorine, it had nine protons and it had seven electrons in its outer shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, that makes nine. So seven in its outer shell, it's a 7A element. So that's going to become important. We're going to show electrons as being dots. So if this is an atom, we have Lewis dot structures. And I got to start relaxing and telling myself I have to trust or actually watching the videos. But with all the questions I got yesterday, I really got to wonder. Nobody's really writing to me, so maybe it's just that easy the way I'm lecturing. If this was an atom, and if there was a 1A element, one electron in a data shell, I draw one dot. If it was a 2A element, two electrons in a data shell, I draw a dot in a different spot. Because they do repel each other. 3A element, three electrons in a data shell. 4A element, 
four electrons of its outer shell. That would be like a carbon if I had a C in the center. And then 5 a element, I start to have a lone pair. Then 6a element, I would put another pair here. There's only two electrons in any one region of space. That's what I'm getting at. And I feel like I can erase any time I like here compared to a live class because you could always stop and look at the board. It seems to be quite clear on this camera right now. Now, I said last time that atoms want as many electrons as a noble gas. And only two electrons can be in any one region of space. I said a region of space where two electrons can be is called an orbital. And there are orbital types. Each shell has an S, there's a capital S, orbital. Each shell has an S orbital. An S orbital is a sphere. I'm not drawing a very good sphere, I'm drawing a circle, but I'm not drawing in three dimensions, I'd have to shape it. The first shell has an S orbital that's a sphere. The second shell would have another sphere, but it'd be bigger because the shell is the distance from the nucleus. The shell is the energy level. So a first shell can have at most two electrons. So it only has an S orbital. And you could show them like this if you wanted to. Spin up, spin down. Then the second shell, the second period, has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight electrons that could be in a second shell, but only two can be in any one region of space. So this is the first shell. For my second shell, there would be one sphere with two electrons. It would be bigger than the sphere for the first shell. But that only takes care of two electrons in the second shell. There's still six more. Another type of orbital is a p orbital. A p orbital is like a dumbbell, we say. That's an orbital. It's a region of space where an electron could be if the electron was there, if there was a p orbital. The electron could be on this side or this side, but it can't be in the center because that's where the protons would be. How the electron gets from one side to the other side, it has to do with the fact that electrons are more of a wave than a particle. It's so small. 1,836 or 37 electrons makes the way to one proton. I need, there's my s orbital, two electrons. I need a place for six more electrons, and if any one orbital can have at most two electrons, and I need six more electrons, I'm going to need three more orbitals. So these are the first two for the S, takes me as far as beryllium, but to get these six electrons in here, we draw three orbitals, and this is going to look like six orbitals to you. Or perhaps it will, perhaps it won't. But if you got the concept, if I said P orbital, this one would be one P orbital. There could be two electrons in that, one up, one down. And then this one, try to draw in different ways, would be the second P orbital. And then the third one would look like that. That would be a P orbital system. That's going to become important for the shapes of carbon chains when we do soaps and things like that. They're going to have this thing because of their P orbitals. So anyway, atoms want as many electrons as a noble gas. Atoms can give away electrons or pick up 
electrons or share electrons. If they share, it's going to be called a covalent bond. If one picks up and one gives away, they're held together by charges, it's going to be called an ionic bond. So let's do one particular atom. Sodium, atomic number of 11. One A element, I get audible chants from my room, but there's no one to chant back to me now, but one A element, one electron, and it's out of shell. I say pick up seven, seven plus 11 is 18. That would be a fine place to go because they want as many electrons as a noble gas. Pick up seven or lose one. 11 minus one is 10. That would be fine, but what are we losing? We're losing electrons, not protons, things in the shells. So sodium, if I say pick up seven or lose one, you'd say lose one. Sodium has an atomic number of 11 protons and it's got 11 electrons neutral. But in nature, I don't think there ever was a sodium atom neutral. I think mankind had to come along and force the sodium atom to take the electron. How was sodium in nature? I think all the sodium atoms on this planet, and I have no proof of this, but I believe it. Sodium has 11 electrons, but it would rather have 10 like neon. So take this off, make that a 10. A positive 11 and a negative 10 together give you a positive 1. This Na plus 1, which I wrote up there last time, I just saw myself do it, is called the sodium ion. And it's a cation because it's positive. The sodium ion, and it's a cation because it's positive. As an ion, it conducts electricity in water. It conducts electricity in water. All ions conduct electricity in water. That'll become important in a minute. Let me race over here. Now, chloride, 7A element, 7 electrons in this outer shell. 7A element, pick up one to have as many as argon, lose 7 to have as many as neon. Both would be fine. But it's going to do something simpler in this case. Picking up one to have as many as argon is easier than losing 7. 17 minus 7 would be 10, that'd be fine. 17 plus 1 would be as many as argon, that'd be fine. Starts off with 17 for an atomic number. So 17 protons, 17 electrons. 7A element, pick up one or lose seven. You're going to say pick up one negative electron. Change to 17, 2, and 18. Negative 18, positive 17. You get a negative one. Cl minus one is called chloride. It's an ion because it has a charge. It's an anion because it's negative, and it's also an electrolyte. All ions can conduct electricity in water. Pure water, like the deionized water from the laboratory, should not conduct electricity. If I were to show a sodium atom, one A element, with the Lewis dot structure, that'd be one dot. And if I were to show a chlorine atom, seven A element, seven dots, one A element, pick up seven or lose one, you say lose one. That's the one it loses. Because this dot structure thing only shows the valence electrons. Chlorine, seven element, pick up one and lose seven. You say pick up one. These are a natural pair. He loses one to him. 
This becomes Na plus one, which is the sodium ion. This becomes Cl minus one, which becomes chloride. These two hold together and they're evenly charged with each other, plus one and minus one. So they hold together in something called an ionic bond. NaCl, that is an ionic compound. There is an ionic bond there. These are very strong. So a very high melting point. If you heat up table salt on a spoon, let's say you wanted to take some table salt and inject it in your veins like heroin, you'd have to heat it up to like 900 degrees. And you wouldn't be able to do that. You can't make molten NaCl easily with a lighter. When we talk about covalent compounds, they're going to melt much easier. So they're very strong, but very brittle. That's an odd thing. How can you have such a strong bond that breaks so easily? It's very strong, but very brittle. Well, I'll show you that. When you have a block of salt, let's say you have sheep and you're feeding them with a salt lick, or you have deer and it's a salt lick, they need electrolytes. Well, I'll just say this right now. They need Na plus one, and they need K plus one. That's because you feed your cells with the sodium, potassium, pump. Potassium is pretty darn important to your body for feeding your cells. If I have pure water and the pure water had no ions like deionized water, this should not conduct electricity. Now, I wouldn't want you to get inside of a bucket of water and add electricity to it and hope for the best because there's going to be some ions and you would probably die. OK, but if there's any ions, let's say this Cl minus one, it's going to conduct electricity. That's an electrolyte. Any charged ion is an electrolyte. But we only think of electrolytes in Gatorade, Na plus and Cl minus, I'm sorry, and K plus. I'll explain why it's K plus. But we only think about Na plus and K plus because those are the two electrolytes that feed our cells, so we, we try to replenish electrolytes. If you have like diarrhea for a while from a flu, or you're really, really old, you can lose electrolytes, and then you have to go on potassium therapy. And potassium is very important, too much potassium. We use potassium for lethal injections, okay? Because it has to do with the heart muscle, et cetera. Anyway, why are they very brittle? Well, let me explain that, and then I'll explain the potassium ion. Let's say you have a salt block of NaCl. It's going to be a very large crystal lattice repeating of Na plus Cl minus Na plus Cl minus trillions of times. Held together by electrostatic attraction. There's no sharing of electrons. The positive charge is held with the negative charge. It takes a lot of heat to melt it because it's such a strong bond, the ionic bond, the ionic compound. But it breaks easily because the minute you break this, you get this off track. You suddenly have a Cl minus and an Na plus and a Cl minus. What have you done here? I usually ask questions in a live class. All of a sudden, light charges are near each other and they cleave. That's why when you break a crystal, you hear a popping sound sometimes because they don't like each other all of a sudden. They want to get away from each other. As strong as they held together, that's how strong they break up. Now, periodic trends. I said chlorine, neutral, could pick up one electron to have as many as argon. 
And if it does, it's Cl minus one, it's chloride. There's a periodic trend for these halogens, the 7A element or halogens, I'll remind you of that. As salts halides, I wrote, but we'll talk about what salts mean. The 7A elements would love to pick up one electron. Bromine can pick up one electron to go from 35 to 36. So he'll take a negative one and be bromide. Chlorine picks up one to be chloride. Fluorine picks up one to have as many as neon, and that would be fluoride. F-L-U-R-I-D-E. F-L-U-R-I-D-E? No, I'll, I'll figure it out. F-L-U-O-R-I-D-E, yeah, that would be fluoride. Over here, I had sodium as an atomic number of 11. If it picked up seven, it would have 18 like argon, that'd be fine. But if it loses one, 11 minus one is 10. It lost something negative and only one. It was neutral before. If you lose one negative thing, you're positive by one. So we call this the sodium ion. Potassium takes a well plus one because he has an atomic number of 19, one A element, one dot in the outer shell, one electron in the outer shell. If he loses one, 19 minus one is 18. That would be a noble gas. Potassium and sodium take a plus one. Lithium, one A element, one dot in the outer shell. He could pick up seven and go from three to 10, and that'd be fine. But if he loses one, it goes from three down to two, and that's helium's electronic configuration. He's happy. So lithium takes a plus one, the lithium ion. This column, you'll often see a plus one written on top of it. This column, you'll often see a minus one written on top of it. The only thing strange about this column, these were, again, the alkali metals. The only thing strange about the alkali metals is that's not a metal, that's hydrogen. Hydrogen, if you recall, had an atomic number of one and an atomic weight of one. I want to talk about him again. So if you have hydrogen, atomic weight of one, atomic number of one, that has one proton, one electron, and Atomic weight minus atomic number. Protons plus neutrons minus just protons would be neutrons. It has zero neutrons. This is the hydrogen atom. If I take a hydrogen, like if I take a sodium and A and I say minus one E minus, I get the sodium ion and he's fine. If I take a hydrogen, and I say minus one E minus, I get the H plus ion. And what is the H plus ion? We call it the proton. And why do we call it the proton? Because if you have a hydrogen atom, which is a proton and an electron, and you remove that electron, it's nothing but a proton. And this, burns you. Anything that gives off the proton is called an acid. And we do need to discuss acids at some point. Anything that gives off the proton is called an acid. So it, this 1A will take a plus one. Now, do some of the other ones. Working backwards from the end. Here's your oxygen, 6A element, six electrons in its outer shell. When I say 6A element, pick up two. Eight plus two is 10, that would be fine. Pick up two negative things. Lose six. Eight minus six is two, that would be fine. It's a board game. You're trying to get to the last column. So oxygen can pick up two or lose six. You say, well, it sounds easier to pick up two. Oxygen and atomic number of eight, it won't do this for long. So that's eight protons, eight electrons. 
pick up two of those six, we say pick up two, pick up two what? We're not changing the protons, they're inside of the nucleus. So we change the electrons and we get 10 E minus, a negative 10 and a positive eight, negative two. O minus two is called oxide. The periodic trend for the 7A, pick up one, pick up one, pick up one, fluorides are minus one, chlorides are minus one, bromides are minus one. The 6A, pick up two, oxygen would be a minus two, sulfur, atomic number of 16. He's two away from argon, he can pick up two. So if sulfur picks up two, he's also a minus two. This set is a minus two. Working my way over here. Lithium, pick up seven, lose one, lose one, go from a three down to a two with helium. He was a plus one, sodium is a plus one, that's the periodic trend for the 1A elements. Potassium is a plus one. The two A's, magnesium, atomic number of 12, pick up six to have as many as argon, lose two, 12 minus two is neon, is 10. So he would grab and lose two, let's just do it one more time. Mg is positive 12 and negative 12, but he's not happy being positive 12 and negative 12 because he's got positive 12 protons, negative 12 electrons. Pick up six or lose two, lose two. What number am I changing? I'm changing electrons. This goes down to a negative 10. Negative 10 and a positive 12 gives you a positive two. Mg plus two is the magnesium ion. This column takes a plus two. Calcium, atomic number of 20, can lose two. 20 minus two is 18. So calcium, magnesium, strontium, barium down here, they're all plus two as well. Over on this side, nitrogen. Now let's jump to this. Pick up three. One, two, three, that's fine. Lose five. One, two, three, four, Five, that'd be fine. It starts almost doing both. You do have nitrogens with a plus five, but it picks up three as an anion. So the nitrogen, atomic number is seven, that's seven protons, seven electrons, pick up three, the seven becomes a 10. A negative 10 and a positive seven gives you a negative three. Your nitrogen is a negative three. This makes a negative three, that's called nitride. So, phosphorus, what would the periodic trend be there? I usually wait for students to answer. Maybe that's why my classes go so much longer with real classes. I don't know, I'm probably teaching way too fast. I'll get used to this. Phosphorus, pick up three, I'll lose five. Pick up three. Pick up three negative things, you become a negative three. What's it called? It's not called the phosphorus ion. Negative three, it becomes an ide. This is phosphide. Finally, the only one I care about is the 3A. I'm gonna leave those alone, alone, alone. We'll leave these alone for now because they're part of organic chemistry carbon. It picks up four, use, loses four. Yes, it does. But aluminum, pick up five, I lose three. It's easier to lose three. You have 13 for aluminum, positive 13, negative 13. Losing three, 13 minus three is 10. Change the electrons, so that's the only thing that's changing. Positive 13 and negative 10, that's a plus three. Aluminum takes a plus three. So this is plus three. And those are useful, even if you didn't understand any of this lecture. What ion do the plus one, the 1A elements take plus one, the 2A take plus two? These here called the transition metals. The transition metals are gonna change things, change things a whole lot. So what can we do with this? Well, we can name some stuff. First of all, you call this naming simple metals 
to non metals. Just name the cation first, the anion second. This is for 1A through 8A. It's not for these transition metals. They change something. They're going to change their charge. Charge is called oxidation state. Phosphorus takes a minus 3 as phosphide. Its oxidation state is minus 3, we say. So if I said to you, aluminum chloride, what I tell students is, write the cation first, write the anion second, and then cross down the absolute values of the charges. If I say aluminum chloride, on your periodic table, you look up aluminum, you see he's a plus three, you write AL plus three. Chloride. That's a chlorine with a negative one charge. You write Cl minus one. Now we can look at this and say a plus three to be fully balanced because the world is going to have as many cations as there are anions is going to be neutral. You would need three of these Cl minus ones. But you can just cross it down and make that work. AlCl3, that's the only formula of aluminum chloride that you need. You don't always cross down. If I said to you, magnesium oxide, I've given you the name, I want the formula, okay? Magnesium, 2A element, plus two. That's Mg plus two. Oxygen, 6A element, minus two. O minus two. You're not gonna cross this down and have Mg2O2. The only reason you cross it down is to make sure you have the same amount of cations as anions, or maybe the same total charge of cations as anions. You have a plus three and three minus one chlorides, it balances. Over here, Mg's a plus two, O's a minus two, they balance already. So this is only MgO and nothing else. That makes some sense to you. What would I call this and would it be correctly written? ALN. Well, let's see. Aluminum's your cation is written first. Plus three. AL plus three. Nitrogen's your anion is written second, minus three. N minus three. They balance, it's just ALN. Name the cation, name the anion. This is called aluminum nitride. That makes some sense. Now, there's some other interesting things. Here's two species for you. FeCl2, FeCl3. They both exist. FeCl2 exists. FeCl3 exists. They're different. They differ by the number of chlorines. For those two, let's just say the cation and the anion. Fe is in the center. If I look on my periodic table, Fe is called iron. So Fe is iron. So this is iron. Cl is chloride. And this is also iron chloride. Sodium chloride is NaCl, it's never gonna change. Calcium being a plus two, calcium chloride is CaCl2. That's never gonna change. But iron can take either two chlorines or three chlorines. That changes. So the metal is taking a different charge. 
you want to name them like the isotopes. When we did the isotopes of uh, carbon, we said carbon 14, carbon 12, when we were distinguishing between the two isotopes. In this case for iron, the iron is still iron, the chloride is still chloride, but the charge of the iron changes. Let's work backwards. Chloride is not going to change. That's a minus one. So you've got a minus one times three, that's minus six. No, no. Minus one times three is minus three. The opposite of minus three is plus three. Over here, chloride is minus one. That's not going to change. You got a minus one times two, it's a minus two. The opposite is plus two. If there was two ions here, we'd have to divide it by two. If there were three, divided by three. But it's only one iron who's doing a plus two charge. This is iron with a plus two charge. This iron over here, negative three, that iron must be a plus three, is a plus three charge. The way you name it is you write this as iron, Roman numerals, brackets two, iron, Roman numerals, bracket three. If I said to you, iron three oxide, this I had the name formula I wanted the name. Now I have the name and I want the formula. If I had iron three oxide, and let's compare it to aluminum oxide, I think I'm staying with it in the camera. I can see that iron three oxide to aluminum oxide. For aluminum oxide, I say aluminum three element plus three. Don't skip the crossing down stage. Al is a plus three. Oxide, 6A element minus two. O is a minus two. Cross it down, Al2O3. That's aluminum oxide. Al plus three times two. Al plus three. Al plus three. O minus two times three. O minus two. O minus two. O minus two. You got a plus six and a minus six, crossing it down, got you there. When I heard aluminum oxide, I looked at my periodic table, aluminum is a plus three. I looked at my periodic table, oxygen is a minus two. When I have iron three oxide, I look at my periodic table, oxygen is a minus two. But I don't look at my periodic table for iron. It's right here. But these guys change. I have to work backwards or I have to be told it's charge. In this case, I'm given the Roman numeral three. That tells me it's Fe plus three. Cross it down, Fe2O3. Aluminum oxide, iron oxide. Hopefully that makes some sense. So I think I need to do another lecture because there's a lot more to do and I'm not just going to drag this out. So let me stop this camera here at 50 minutes. Start again. <sighs> Leave. I'll stop recording now. <laughs>